Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Maybe a good morning or good evening for some people, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to the webinar organized by the European Reference Kidney Network for Rare Diseases. My name is Elena Levchenko. I'm a pediatric nephrologist from Leuven, Belgium, and I will moderate this webinar for you today. I'm really happy to introduce our speaker, Professor Tom Nijenhuis from Nijmegen, the Netherlands. He is one of the rare adult nephrologists who is very much interested in rare kidney diseases. He is a full professor of rare kidney diseases in Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen. Um, he uh, um, is working during many years on um, different rare kidney diseases and uh, got several awards for this. He got the best PhD award when he studied the epithelial calcium and magnesium channels in different rare kidney diseases. So it was some time ago. And then he was awarded by Dutch Kidney Foundation as a junior and senior golf career as stimulation awardees. And he's very active in the ERCNET as an adult nephrologist um, in the tubulopathies working group, but also in many other working groups. So Tom will present today our uh, on the topic uh, of gentleman syndrome, uh, mainly in adults. And it's also very nice that uh, we started with a new uh, tradition in the ERCNET webinars to invite patients having the disease. So we will have a patient voice today. So very much welcome to our webinar. Now I will switch off my camera and my, uh, my microphone, but please uh, be active for questions. You can ask your questions using the questions part of your attendees panel. So very much welcome. And Tom, please uh, start your presentation. OK, thank you, uh, Elena. Thank you, everybody. Um, I am, um, uh, as Elena said, Tom Nijners. I'm an, uh, uh, an adult nephrologist from Nijmegen. Um, and I'm uh, very glad to give this presentation today on gentleman syndrome, and uh, especially on the adult view. Um, and maybe you can uh, remember that in October of last year, we had a presentation of my colleague uh, Martin Conrad, who's a pediatric nephrologist on partners and gentleman syndrome uh, um, in the uh, pediatric uh, or with a pediatric view. Um, let me see if I can switch the slide. Yeah, here it is. So gentleman syndrome, of course, is a renal tubulopathy. Um, and I always uh, start my presentations for students with this slide. Uh, to underscore how important these renal tubules actually are uh, because, um, uh, and I've calculated this uh, some time ago, if we would not have these renal tubules, we would lose uh, 180 liters of water per, uh, per day, uh, about one and a half kilograms of table salt per day, um, the potassium equivalent of about 48 bananas a day, uh, the calcium equivalent of about seven liters of milk a day, and the magnesium equivalent of about two kilograms of almonds per day. Uh, and of course, you can imagine that we cannot, uh, um, uh, that we need these tubules because we cannot correct this uh, just by eating this much. Uh, and if you are, think that I am completely ig ignorant to the important role of um, the tubules for um, uh, uh, acid base homeostasis. Um, I, I guess I just was a bit lazy in uh, calculating how much uh, um, baking soda sh you should eat if you would not have any renal tubules. Uh, but at least Jitterman syndrome is also a uh, tubulopathy and it is a salt losing tubulopathy, uh, which is actually, um, I'm not seeing my uh, pointer here, um, um, but we'll, we can do without. Um, so it's a salt losing tubulopathy, which is actually uh, in the oh, distal column. You can see your pointer actually, so you can use it. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, the interesting thing is that <laughs> that I cannot see my pointer. Um, so uh, so I'll not use it because I'm not knowing <laughs> because I'm not seeing what I'm actually pointing at. Um, but at least gentleman syndrome is uh, is located uh, in the distal convoluted tubule, and I've depicted here a distal convoluted tubule cell cell with some of the transport mechanisms which which are in this uh, tubule cell, uh, and on the apical side is also the sodium chloride co-transporter, and it's actually uh, 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 this sodium chloride co-transporter which is encoded by uh, the gene SLC12A3 that is mutated in this uh, autosomal recessive uh, disorder. 
Uh, and therefore, uh, let's say the sodium reabsorptive capacity of the distal co convoluted tubule is hampered uh, and you lose uh, sodium uh, in your urine. Um, and actually, um, this loss of sodium in your urine is a problem uh, because um, uh, salt losing nephropathies uh, and salt losing tubulopathies actually lead to a hypokalemic alkalotic phenotype. And they do this because this loss of sodium chloride, in this case, in the distal convoluted tubule, and Gittleman syndrome, which is uh, actually uh, a bit like a chronic thiazide diuretic user because this sodium chloride co-transporter is actually also the molecular target of uh, the thiazide class of diuretics. And with this, you lose salt. Um, this leads to uh, increased distal tubular flow and sodium delivery to the epithelial sodium channel, which is in the uh, collecting duct, de depicted uh, in uh, purple here. Um, and also, uh, the uh, let's say the loss of sodium chloride leads to a lower extracellular volume, which increases your renin angiotensin aldosterone system, increases aldosterone, which furthermore uh, stimulates your ENAC. And this actually looks to be a good thing, because in this way you can compensate for some of the sodium chloride that you are actually losing by increasing sodium uh, chloride reabsorption in your collecting duct but you do this at the expense of the loss of potassium and hydrogen ions and thus a hypokalemic alkalosis so that is a hallmark of this uh, disease it's a salt losing hypokalemic alkalotic uh, disorder and there are more uh, hypokalemic uh, alkalotic salt losing uh, 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 tubulopathies for instance the barter syndrome uh, i will not go into the molecular detail now but uh, this is a similar disorder, only there the problem is in a thick ascending limb uh, um, uh, of, the, of the renal tubule. Um, there also your sodium chloride reabsorption is hampered. In this case, um, it is the sodium chloride reabsorption mechanism that can also be um, affected by using loop diuretics. So in this case, you could say these are the chronic loop diuretic users or the genetic loop diuretic users, but also there you see an increased sodium chloride um, uh, um, coming into your collecting duct, a low extracellular volume, and thereby uh, compensatory sodium chloride reabsorption there, uh, but at, at the expense of potassium and hydrogen ions. Well, what other um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 what other clinical signs are there in uh, uh, Gittleman syndrome? Uh, well, like I said, hypokalemic alkalosis, uh, but you also see a renal hypomagnesemia. And, and if I could see where I was pointing, I would point here at the uh, epithelial magnesium channel that is called TRIP-M6 in this uh, slide. And actually the um, uh, transcellular active magnesium reabsorptive capacity is also in these distal convoluted tubule uh, cells. And the idea is that uh, the loss of the sodium chloride co-transporter hampers these cells and might even lead to an, uh, to an involution of the first part of the DCT, the DCT1, which reduces your, hypo, uh, your uh, magnesium reabsorptive capacity and therefore leading to uh, magnesium uh, increase, uh, increased magnesium losses uh, through the urine and thus hypomagnesemia. Another hallmark of Gittleman syndrome is hypocalcuria, so a low calcium uh, in the urine. I will not go into the uh, uh, details uh, of the mechanism here, uh, but very uh, broadly, um, uh, this could be either due to the fact that due to the extracellular volume decrease, you uh, not only increase your so uh, sodium reabsorption in the collecting duct as a compensation, but also more proximally, and thereby you also uh, reabsorb more calcium uh, uh, together with the sodium that is reabsorbed over there. Or there is a direct link to the uh, active calcium reabsorption, with all, which also resides in the distal convoluted tubule. And I think the jury is still not out on this mechanism. And of course, because you have sodium loss, uh, low extracellular volume, these patients tend to have a normal to low blood pressure. So hypokalemic alkalosis, renal hypomagnesemia in, I think, most of the patients, hypocalcuria, and a ten tendency to have a low blood pressure. So what signs and symptoms uh, does this now give? Well, this is a table from uh, a uh, um, KDCO controversy conference paper from about five years ago, and it sums up uh, 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 different signs and symptoms that, that pa patients can have in Gittleman syndrome. And if you look at the left, uh, um, uh, the left bar with the most common 
symptoms. Then you see here cramps and muscle weakness, probably due to the electrolyte uh, disorders. A lot of patients uh, um, uh, complain about fatigue. Uh, patients also have salt craving, so they tend to eat more salt, which is, pro uh, which is probably uh, because your body is actually telling you that you are salt losing. Uh, things like dizziness, maybe something to do with the low blood pressure, uh, paresthesia, numbness, um, palpitations, uh, and uh, let's say symptomatic low blood pressure. Um, the interesting thing is if you see this graph, uh, you would say that uh, this, is, uh, this is a rather impressive uh, set of signs and symptoms. But in literature, uh, literature gentleman syndrome is often um, uh, described as a mild phenotype. And, and whereas in some patients that may be true, um, I think that mild is relative, and it's especially relative because uh, gentleman's is also see, uh, always seen in the spectrum of, let's say, antenatal barter syndrome to uh, gentleman syndrome. And then maybe relative to the other uh, uh, disorders, uh, it might be mild, uh, but uh, if you see this uh, at this table, it does not seem mild at all. Uh, but who am I to uh, who am I to say? And therefore, it is very good that we have a gentleman patient with us today. Uh, because I think the patient voice here is, is important, and I think that she uh, can attest to the impact that gentleman syndrome can have on your day-to-day -day life. Uh, so I would like to give the floor at this moment to our uh, gentleman patient, um, uh, which because of, uh, of privacy issues, we have uh, chosen not to name her uh, or to uh, show uh, her on camera. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nijnhuis and Ernest, for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my experience. Um, so I'm 46 year old, um, diagnosed with uh, gentleman syndrome when I was uh, 39. Um, uh, let's see, when, uh, during childhood and adolescence, I did not experience a lot of symptoms. I was quite healthy, except for a few times that I had like, uh, cramps and tingling. And when I was in kindergarten, I was made to hospital for a few days for checkup and after uh, supplementation of magnesium uh, and uh, some checkups, uh, regular checkups in the blood, um, everything went back to normal basically. Um, so um, I did not have regular checkups or medications or supplements at that time. And uh, maybe go to the next slide. Thank you. So, um, during my adult uh, age, um, I started to develop uh, severe symptoms uh, in the 30s, and uh, I think it was probably because of exhaustion physically. And since then, um, I'm taking uh, potassium and magnesium and to supplement the shortage. And um, my health was quite uh, good for about nine years. Uh, no major health uh, symptoms related to gentleman syndrome. And I also had, uh, I didn't have any uh, regular checkups, uh, probably twice. And um, so it all went well for, for a long time. And then about six and a half years ago, I had a relapse. And uh, there was also the time that I, did the DNA test, so it was diagnosed that I had a gentleman syndrome. <coughs> Sorry, did the DNA test. Um, from that time on, um, the, the medication, oh sorry, the, the supplements um, dosage had to be increased, and I started taking uh, medication as well uh, for reabsorption of the minerals. And I uh, am having regular checkups, uh, health checks since then. And uh, the big change uh, from the years before is that uh, the energy levels decreased and it took a long time for me to recuperate. So um, let's go to the next topic. So the, the challenges and, and the needs and concerns that I have and probably I think a lot of other gentlemen patients uh, uh, share with me are the ups and downs in physical health and uh, so uh, emotional health, um, there are some challenges in that sometimes because I have to deal with uh, uncertainty and uh, sometimes frustration, and anxiety, and not trusting my own body, 
care, uh, but also uh, my case uh, overcompensation because I don't want to appear uh, weak, uh, for instance, at work. So um, yeah, so I, I I sometimes overcompensate, which yeah, resulting in uh, you know exhausting myself again. Um, and then uh, thank you. Uh, Another challenge uh, is uh, every time when uh, when I encounter problems with physical health, uh, I need to try to accept the new situation again. So we need to be adaptable. Um, I noticed that it, <coughs> sorry, my uh, yeah the quality of life has changed. Um, it's sometimes uh, challenging to to have a good work-life balance and of course social life uh, sometimes is different as well in, in times when health is not that great and of course uh, yeah, social life is, is not uh, not uh, uh, I say, not a priority at that moment and um, also what I found difficult is uh, dealing with misunderstandings uh, about this uh, disorder, so it's it's hard to explain um, what it is in the first place. But also, uh, one of the symptoms that occurs quite often is uh, tiredness. And, uh, yeah, it, it's hard sometimes to explain uh, like why this tiredness related to children is different than just normal tiredness um, or fatigue. Um, and the next uh, challenge uh, I encountered um, is uh, sometimes it's also hard to explain um, that uh, uh, sort of the urgency um, of uh, when it's not going that way, then it's very important that the blood checks need to be done uh, fast and uh, uh, so what I would like to want to say is, uh, I think it's a really important that um, awareness will be increased among uh, about Jitterman syndrome among healthcare professionals as well, because it's really rare. So it's um, yeah, it's, it's it's not when I'm tired, it's not like uh, that I can just have a rest and then I feel better again. Sometimes that's sufficient. But it can also mean that maybe there's something wrong with mineral levels, and that uh, there is just, there's urgency. And um, another thing is, uh, I noticed that uh, like my sister had it as well, and probably my brother too. And also, I heard from other treatment patients that there's a lot of like variety. Like, it, no patient is the same. All very different, and I also notice myself like uh, I've had times I work like a lot, like 40 hours or even 80 hours in a week. Felt really great to not being able to walk up the stairs. So it's so um, uh, it can be really unstable, and per person is really different. So I think it's really important to like free time to have a personal treatment. And uh, let's see. Um, another challenge is, is uh, coverage of healthcare insurance. Not uh, not all healthcare insurance companies cover uh, supplements, uh, so that has been an issue. And also uh, to find the right uh, a, a suitable supplement that will uh, that will not give too many side effects, and that's different per person. And um, what I also from other gentlemen patients and also experience myself is uh, sometimes there, uh, there are delays in, um, in medication for delivery um, because of I could for instance with potassium that uh, certain material is not available so that there are delays or even uh, production stops certain medication and um, how much time do I have? So, well, you, you can uh, you can uh, go on and finish the, the last uh, two. Uh... Thank you. 
And um, and another question that I have is um, because sometimes the, the imbalance happens at night and then don't want to go to hospital to, 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 to have your blood check. So I was wondering, uh, yes, so what would be really interesting for judgment patients if there are any like, self-tests for, uh, yeah, self-tests to, to, to see what your mineral levels are so you can adjust the, the medication for your uh, supplements yourself. And um, the last thing is um, really curious also to know um, and to keep up to date about uh, uh, the effects of prolonged um, mineral, uh, low mineral levels. So um, I'm really interested in also like uh, how can I prevent maybe other problems in the future? Like for, for instance, menopause, you know, slow things change and does it have effect on the minerals and so on. So I would like to conclude the presentation here because I think it's <laughs> So thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Um, and I think that your uh, a test at least shows the impacts uh, what what this kind of disorders can have on your life. Uh, and in all honesty, a lot of the questions that you ask are very valid, um, and and also shows us that uh, for a lot of these questions we actually don't have a um, a good answer uh, yet. So uh, a lot is still uh, to do there. Um, Maybe when when resuming uh, um, uh, my presentation, um, I, I thought that it would be a good idea to say something about differential diagnosis, and and how do we now come up and come to a, a diagnosis in a, in a patient uh, um, with uh, uh, with let's say a possible diagnosis of Gittelman syndrome, and I guess that most patients actually present with the hypokalemia that, that is most often the the, uh, the presenting symptom and then uh, um, uh, uh, and then the hypo, uh, the alkalosis is uh, is soon discovered so i thought we we might start with with hypokalemic alkalosis and if you then look at the differential diagnosis of uh, hypokalemic alkalosis um yeah this actually results from both acquired causes or rare genetic uh, uh, tubular disorders um with the uh, acquired uh, um, disorders including uh, for instance and we we now understand why that is uh, loop diuretics uh, thiazide diuretic use uh, but also uh, 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 patients with uh, anorexic who are anorexic or have bulimia or who are using laxatives uh, can have a hypokalemic alkalosis um, things like uh, uh, which is something important in Holland, licorice uh, inge uh, um, uh, ingestion, uh, but also hyperaldosteronism. Uh, and and that, that the genetic par uh, uh, part of the differential diagnosis, you can think of the salt losing nephropathies like Bowser and Gittelman syndrome. Uh, but, the, but the very interesting thing is all, also Little's syndrome, which is actually not a, a salt losing disorder, but it nicely shows, uh, let's say, uh, this compensatory mechanism, which is also there in Bowser and Gittelman syndrome. Because little syndrome is actually a gain of function mut uh, mutation in the epithelial sodium channel ENAC. Uh, and therefore, uh, there you have a genetic uh, hyperactivity of this ENAC channel, which leads to more sodium being reabsorbed at the expense again of potassium and hydrogen ions. But of course, this uh, th th there is no salt losing here, but, but uh, rather an increased reabsorption of uh, sodium chloride. So this actually leads to hypertension and not so much to hypotension as you can see in Gittelman syndrome. So uh, I already crossed out here the hypertensive uh, uh, disorders, uh, helping us a little bit in differential uh, uh, diagnosis uh, uh, because we measure blood pressure in our patients and uh, uh, she or he had a low, lowish blood, uh, blood pressure. Um, and then if you want to see whether there are actually gastrointestinal uh, losses or renal losses, you can, uh, um, and, and this was beautifully shown in this, in this uh, uh, paper by uh, Wu et al. recently, uh, you can look at uh, urine biochemistry. Um, and let's say generally when you have a gastrointestinal loss, uh, um, you would expect that your urine, sodium and chloride would be low course because you try to compensate uh, let's say the loss of uh, either sodium and chloride or both from your gastrointestinal tract and in renal losses you would expect high urine sodium and chloride levels um, but it's also interesting that um, if you have a uh, 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 if you have a gastrointestinal loss it, um, let's say the sodium chloride ratio in your urine can actually tell you where you are losing uh, 
uh, which uh, ion, because if you are anorectic or, bu or bulimic, then you lose gastric juice, and gastric juice uh, contains more chloride than sodium. Uh, so eventually, there will be less chloride than sodium in your urine. Uh, uh, in the situation of laxatives, it's, it's the other way around, because stool, which you lose uh, um, with diarrhea or laxatives, actually contains more potassium and sodium than it does chloride. Uh, so in that case, you have less sodium than chloride in your urine. So this can help you in differential diagnosis. Um, when you are taking diuretics, or you actually have a, a very rare salt losing nephropathy, um, then your urine sodium chloride is actually coupled. So the ratio of your uh, sodium concentration, chloride concentration in the urine is actually more or less the same. Um, um, uh, and, and the interesting thing with diuretics is because some of these patients that present uh, um, uh, with the possible diagnosis of Gitterman syndrome are actually uh, taking uh, thiazide diuretics, but they are just not telling you. Um, uh, is that uh, if you do uh, multiple spot urines, uh, then uh, with diuretic use, uh, you would expect that you have a, a coupled ratio, so let's say a ratio of about one, uh, but that uh, at certain times you will have a high um, uh, sodium and chloride concentration in, in your urine, but also in, but in the situations where, where the effect of the diuretic has run out, you expect your kidneys to uh, to compensate and to to uh, um, um, collect uh, the sodium and the chloride again. So then you you often see variably high and low urinary sodium and chloride levels. So that can also help you. Um, and that that is what you actually see de depicted in the in the graph uh, at the left. So uh, after we looked at that, and, and you can also look at uh, thiazide and, and, and uh, loop diuretics in the urine or in the blood, um, then eventually we come to the situation where we think that there might be a genetic um, uh, rare uh, tubular um, salt losing disorder uh, in the patient. Uh, and then I come back to this Kaidigo controversies uh, um, uh, paper, uh, where there was a very nice uh, table with diagnostic criteria for Gitterman syndrome. And, and there it says, well, the criteria for suspecting a diagnosis of a Gilman syndrome is actually, well, the, the things that we already said, uh, hypokalemia, alkalosis, hypomagnesemia, which is present in, in the majority of patients with Gitterman syndrome, um, hypocalcuria, um, uh, uh, and, and that is important because, for instance, let's say in, in Barter syndrome, you classically uh, expect a hypercalcuria and a hypocalcuria. So this helps. Of course, you expect high plasma renin uh, activity or, uh, or levels because of the uh, uh, renin angiotensin elder strong system being uh, um, activated, uh, low to normal, uh, low blood pressure, um, and a normal uh, renal ultrasound. Uh, and why that is important um, is that, let's say, in the uh, in barter phenotypes, you have hypercalcuria and the tendency for nephrocalcinosis and uh, kidney stone. Um, and then they said that uh, an important criteria for establishing the diagnosis is uh, a genetic confirmation of the bioallergic inactivating mutations in the SLC12A3 gene. Uh, but the, the paper actually also has a table, um, uh, uh, or it is actually in the same tables, uh, um, showing features that are uh, arguing against a diagnosis of Gitterman syndrome. And this might seem odd at first, but I will tell you why this is important. Um, and of course, th this contains the use of thiazide diuretics or laxatives or whatever. Um, uh, it also contains a family history of a disease transmitted in an autosomal dominant uh, mode, which is, which actually makes sense because uh, uh, Gitterman's is autosomal recessive. Um, of course, absence of hypokalemia, absence of metabolic alkalosis. Um, um, uh, if you have renal ultrasound uh, changes, hypertension. Uh, prenatal uh, history of polyhydramnios uh, uh, or, or hyper, hyper echogenic kidneys, because then you would think more or less along the lines of the antenatal barter syndromes. Uh, and um, uh, Gilman syndrome is most often presented, let's say, in childhood, uh, during adolescence, or even uh, at adult age. I have, uh, I have patients which, have, which were diagnosed at 50 or 60 years of age, uh, but not before the age of three years, most often. Well, why is that? Uh, why is this uh, table actually important? Because we now know that there is not only Gitterman, but there are a couple of Gitterman-like tubulopathies out there. 
So uh, this graph shows the, the, the signs and, and, and characteristics of Gittleman syndrome. So uh, mutations in SLC12A3, autosomal recessive, alkalosis, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcuria, um, lowish blood pressure. Uh, but also, let's say, in Barter syndrome, and you might uh, know this, this, uh, this slide was, because this slide was also in Martin Conrad's uh, presentation in October, where he actually talked about Barter-like syndromes, and that's a, that's a little bit the difference between the adults and the pediatrics view. Pediatrics think these are Barter-like syndromes, and adults and think uh, think that these are Jitterman-like tubulopathies. But he actually showed that you have uh, uh, different forms of uh, Barter syndrome, so antenatal uh, Barter syndrome, which is actually um, uh, caused by mutations in the NKCC2 um, uh, co-transporter or the ROMK potassium channel, uh, but you also have what is what is classically called classic Barter syndrome, which is because of uh, a mutation, mutation in the chloride channel CLCKB. And we actually know that these patients, which we, which we call Barter syndrome type 3, with these CLC-NKB mutations um, uh, also show, of course, a hypokalemic alkalotic uh, phenotype, because that is also the phenotype of Barter syndrome. Uh, and of course, they can show hypercalcuria uh, and uh, nephr nephrolithiasis, nephrocalcinosis. But the part of these patients actually shows uh, uh, hypomagnesemia and a hypocalcuria. So they can have a clear Gittleman uh, phenotype. Um, and that is probably because this uh, chloride channel is also expressed in the distal convoluted tubule and is actually involved with the sodium chloride reabsorption also in this part uh, of the tubule, um, which actually uh, uh, makes it rather logical that this might also lead to a jitterman like uh, uh, tubulopathy. But also in the distal convoluted tubule cells, there are other mutations, for instance, mutations in the transcription factor HNF1 beta, or uh, which, which again regulates the uh, gamma subunit of the sodium potassium ATPase, in which you can also have mutations. And we know that this, these kind of mutations also can lead to a gentleman like tubulopathy. Uh, for instance, in these HNF1 beta patients, uh, as you might know, uh, this can also lead to the uh, disorder ADTKD where you have uh, reduced kidney function, where you have diabetes, where you have gout, renal cysts, uh, um, uh, um, et cetera. Um, but part of the, the phenotype can be a gentleman-like uh, tubulopathies, but this, uh, 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 this phenotype can be very variable, and there are indeed patients that have uh, only the gentleman-like tubulopathy. But of course, there, uh, the inheritance is autosomal uh, dominant. Um, uh, but otherwise, they can look very much like a Gitman patient. And the same actually also holds true for uh, patients with mutations in the gamma subunit of the sodium potassium ATPase uh, encoded by the FIXIT2 protein. Uh, also, there you can have a, 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 a phenotype that, that very much resembles Gitman syndrome. Uh, and uh, um, uh, and in, a, in a paper published only a couple of months ago, uh, we showed with a lot of European colleagues that also mutations in mitochondrial genes, uh, MTTI and MTTF, uh, can actually lead to a gentleman like uh, tubulopathy, which can look very much like uh, uh, the classical gentleman syndrome. So is there any way uh, to differentiate uh, 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 these um, diseases clinically? Uh, well, in the past, um, uh, we used a thiazide test. And why did we use a thiazide test? Well, that actually makes sense because in uh, Gitterman syndrome, you have a mutation in the thiazide sensitive sodium chloride co transporter, which means that the effect of thiazides in these patients would be reduced. Um, and this thiazide test was set up in the past, and these authors uh, clearly showed that if you, look, uh, if you look at the difference in maximal fractional excretion of chloride, that you can nicely differentiate between controls, uh, which have a uh, uh, um, uh, change in fractional excretion of chlor chloride of above 2.3%, uh, and uh, gentleman patients, which are almost all uh, below this, uh, this threshold, whereas the barter patients are uh, above the threshold. So they said, well, this, this um, uh, test actually has a sensitivity of 93% and a specificity of 100%. Of course, in, in the population that was tested, um, uh, which were uh, genetically proven gentlemen and barter patients. 
But does that still hold true? Well, uh, we also tested, uh, 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 let's say, the other patient groups um, with these thiazide tests. And again, we, we saw that the uh, controls all tested above, let's say, the cutoff of 2.3%. So everything is well until this. Um, also, our legitimate patients uh, showed a reduced response to, to thiazide, which is what you would expect. Um, the one barter patient that we uh, could include showed an exaggerated response to thiazide, which is also what you might uh, expect. But if we then looked at these HNF1 beta uh, um, tulopathy patients and, and the one patient that we could um, uh, get in the, in the study uh, with a fixed tumor mutation, also these patients can show a reduced um, uh, response to thiazide. Uh, and uh, in the 2022 page, uh, paper on the uh, uh, mtDNA uh, uh, mutations, uh, we also did uh, thiazide tests in a subset of these patients, and we could show that one uh, out of the five patients test, the tested clearly had a, a reduced response to, uh, to thiazide. So this thiazide test is actually not a good test to diagnose um, Gittelman's uh, syndrome, and especially to differentiate between the different Gittelman-like um, uh, phenotypes. And the other interesting thing is that there are also acquired um, uh, gentleman like tubulopathies, of course, chronic uh, thiazide uh, uh, treatment. Uh, but, but I also uh, found this uh, paper from 2006 uh, interesting. I see that I forgot to put in the reference. But here they show that gentleman syndrome can also be a result of cisplatin therapy. Of course, we know that cisplatin uh, has an acute effect and can, and can have uh, electrolyte uh, disorders. Um, uh, especially uh, uh, a very crude hypomagnesemia. Uh, but here they uh, describe a 42-year-old woman which presented with a 20-year history of hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, hypomagnesemia, hypocalciuria after cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Uh, and I completely agree. Um, the only thing that I don't agree with is that they say that, that this seems to be uh, uh, ultra rare because they say only 13 of, of these patients have ever been described in the literature. Uh, well, um, at our hospital, we have this specific um, uh, outpatient clinic for uh, late effects of, of uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and I must say that I have seen uh, different, uh, uh, several different uh, patients with, which had uh, cisplatin therapy uh, in the past, and they had a uh, um, phenotype that was un indistinguishable from, uh, from Tittman syndrome. And even in one or two, we did uh, uh, genetic testing to be sure that uh, because they, they had the, the, uh, the suspect treatment very early in life, uh, to be sure that they did not have, let's say, a, a, a genetic uh, rare uh, salt losing tubulopathy, namely Gittelman syndrome. So that comes that, that makes me come back to this, this table with diagnostic criteria, because um, if you want to establish the diagnosis of Gittelman syndrome, you need to do genetic uh, analysis and you need to show by allelic inactivated mutations in SLC12A3. Um, uh, uh, so genetics uh, establishes the diagnosis but also dictates nomenclature. And why is this, this latter part important? That's important because um, in the past we said, well, uh, this patient had a phenotype of Gittelman syndrome. And when we did not do, uh, let's say, genetic workup uh, uh, routinely, uh, then, well, all these patients had Gittelman syndrome. Um, and at a certain point, we, we knew that, for instance, Barter syndrome type 3 could look like Gittelman syndrome. Uh, and, then, and then we started doing uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, genetic analysis. And then I know that I, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, I was writing letters about these patients saying, well, this patient has a phenotype of Gittelman syndrome based on a mutation in the CLC-NKB uh, uh, chloride channel. Um, and I think nowadays days we should say that um, uh, genetics dictates nomenclature. So um, a person with an SLC12A3 mutation has Gittelman syndrome. A person with a, a, a CLC-NKB mutation has uh, Barter syndrome type 3, um, um, of, of which we know that it can look like Gittelman syndrome. Um, so switching to treatment, um, our patient already also uh, alluded to that, that that might be difficult. Um, the first and foremost important thing is to realize that this is a salt losing disease. Uh, so we advise our patients to take uh, sodium chloride ad libitum, uh, which means, and they, like I said, they have salt craving. So their body is already telling them that they need uh, uh, to compensate for the salt losses. 
uh, but, but this is important because there often are uh, uh, people uh, close to these patients or even well willing uh, general practi practitioners that actually tell these patients listen you have a uh, um, kidney disease you need to moderate your salt intake and that is absolutely not true because they are losing salt so these are actually the only patients that should take uh, uh, sodium chloride liberally um, and then the next question is um, should we only uh, tell them to eat salty foods or should we pharmacologically supplement uh, sodium chloride and that is something that we are at the moment uh, uh, trying to piece out because there's uh, not that much literature uh, about that uh, and for that i would like to show you two patients um, that i actually uh, treated with sodium chloride uh, the patients at the left patient a um, is a patient in which um, i uh, kept on increasing the potassium supplementations that we are uh, giving these patients which is actually the red line in the graph uh, without actually increasing uh, serum potassium levels which is the bluish uh, uh, line in the graph um, um, up until the moment uh, where I started to uh, supplement there with, uh, with pharmacological or extra-physiological levels of uh, sodium chloride and then all of a sudden I could raise the sodium potassium from two and a half to above three. Um, uh, something similar you see in patient B on the right. This was actually a patient that was uh, that had a rather um, uh, uh, fair uh, uh, serum potassium level of about three, uh, but who could not tolerate uh, the uh, potassium supplementation anymore. So what we did there is we reduced the potassium uh, supplementation to about a third of uh, of the uh, the initial uh, dosage, um, but also gave the gave the patient sodium chloride, and as you can see, um, uh, sodium potassium levels. Uh, even though we reduced the potassium uh, supplementation actually increased. Um, so we thought that, that, that this was very um, encouraging. Uh, so what we are doing at the moment, uh, uh, together with our colleagues in Rotterdam and in London and in Naples, is that we are doing N of 1 trials, which are actually randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind crossover trials in single subjects, um, uh, uh, where we test uh, sodium chloride uh, next to placebo placebo and these patients get 12 grams of sodium chloride per day extra in different treatment blocks uh, and then we look at serum potassium but also at personalized symptom and, and uh, quality of life uh, uh, scores to see whether this actually helps uh, and to provide evidence uh, that uh, superphysiological pharmacological salt supplementation is a good idea in these patients um, so uh, increased salt intake uh, of course, we supplement uh, uh, potassium. Uh, if there are acute and severe uh, symptoms, you uh, can do that intravenously, but that's not very handy if, uh, uh, um, if the patient is outpatient. So eventually you will have to do that uh, with oral potassium supplementation, preferably uh, potassium chloride, because this is because the patients lose chloride, of course, in a slow release uh, formulation. Um, if that is not enough, then there are other possibilities which are uh, um, not first line therapy, at least um, in my view, uh, which are potassium sparing diuretics. But we should um, uh, realize uh, that these work, um, uh, but these also aggravate the salt wasting that is already there in the patient. Another option would be um, uh, using in the medicine. Um, which has also been shown to increase potassium level uh, in these patients moderately um, but also has the down uh, sides of um, uh, maybe uh, uh, being nephrotoxic if you use it for a long period of time and actually uh, our colleagues within Airnet are have set up a survey to look at uh, whether this actually occurs whether uh, let's say patients uh, in this case with Barter syndrome that were treated in, in um, in childhood actually show um, a, a decreased kidney function uh, whilst adult. Um, of course, you could also think about uh, RAS inhibition. Um, uh, that, that might also uh, work, but again, this has a similar uh, downside like the uh, potassium sparing diuretics uh, uh, because you are already, uh, uh, um, you have a patient that is already uh, uh, has the tendency to be hypotensive 
and you could induce symptomatic hypertension uh, with this. And of course, you have to correct the hypomagnesemia because we know that uh, um, with a low magnesium level, it is more difficult to correct uh, potassium. Well, what goal should you should you then strive for? Uh, well, again, this uh, KDGO controversy uh, conference uh, uh, conference has uh, set a goal of uh, above uh, uh, 3.0 millimoles per liter, and I think that is a very sensible goal uh, because that is safe. Um, and uh, uh, let's say experience dictates that it's very difficult to normalize uh, uh, serum potassium, so to to get above 3.5 in these patients. Um, and in addition, like I said, we have to uh, correct the renal hypomagnesemia if it's if it's there and it's there in, in, in the majority of the patients. Again, with acute and severe symptoms that seem to be the result of uh, 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 of a low magnesium level, you can do that intravenously. But in the long term, you have to do that orally by oral magnesium supplementation. Um, are there any other um, possibilities there? Well, I think not. Um, it is suggested that the potassium sparing diuretics actually also do something on, uh, on magnesium levels, but I'm not completely sure whether that is true. Uh, and again, also here, normalization is difficult uh, uh, to achieve. And the idea is that a magnesium level of about 0.60 is safe. Uh, but of course, if the patient is still experiencing symptoms, uh, you should increase uh, uh, magnesium supplementation until they don't tolerate it anymore to see whether that uh, helps with the symptoms. Well, what magnesium uh, um, uh, salt should you then give? Well, this is a, um, uh, this is a table from a, uh, from a paper from 2001, which sums up, uh, let's say, the, uh, um, uh, the upsides and downsides of the different uh, magnesium uh, supplements that, that can be given. Probably you can't read it because it's too small, but you should not read it as well, because I think in the end, almost all have gastrointestinal side effects, mostly diarrhea, if you give uh, higher uh, uh, dosages. Um, sometimes they're not available. That's also something that our patient alluded to uh, previously. Uh, and let's say this all looks nice in theory, but in practice, it, I think that both the uh, response in terms of serum magnesium, but also the side effects in the, in the patient are actually unpredictable. And, and the fact that it, that, that is true, um, uh, uh, we in the past tried to uh, prove that, uh, again, by do, doing N of 1 trials in patients with renal hypomagnesemia, which we supplemented with oral magnesium supplements, um, I must be uh, um, honest that these were not all gentlemen's patients, but the, the results from the patient that I'm showing you uh, um, are, uh, 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 this was a gentleman uh, a patient. And what we try to do here is do randomized double blind crossover trial, again, in single subjects with three different uh, magnesium uh, salts, magnesium gluconate, aspartate, and lactate. There we looked at magnesium uh, uh, levels in the blood, but also again looked at uh, uh, patient-specific outcome questionnaires uh, and general quality of life questionnaires. And, and this is the result of one of the gentleman patients there, uh, where you can see that actually magnesium gluconate and mag magnesium aspartate led to the same serum magnesium level of 0.60. Uh, but magnesium aspartate was much better uh, with respect to the personalized complaint score and the quality of life questionnaire. And even more interestingly, magnesium lactate, which was uh, worse uh, on these two, uh, um, on these two uh, uh, parameters, actually led to the highest magnesium level. Uh, so that means that, um, and, and if I show you the results of the other patients, then they look completely different. So in conclusion, you, you need to have a personalized or individualized treatment approach, which uh, probably takes some trial and error here. Um, so coming back to gentleman syndrome, um, I think the most important uh, uh, aspects uh, to remember is that it's a distal convoluted uh, tubule disease, a salt losing ne uh, nephropathy, uh, so give them salt. Uh, which leads to hypokalemic alkalosis, uh, um, renal hypomagnesemia, hypocalcuria, tendency to have a low blood pressure. Um, uh, and if you want to uh, uh, confirm the diagnosis, you need uh, uh, a genetic confirmation for that. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we should leave it uh, at this. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. It was really a wonderful lecture. 
very comprehensive, very practical. And uh, thank you for the patient to, to, to show us the, the impact of the disease, which is impressive. And I fully agree with you that the disease really has a great impact. Well, sometimes it's really seen by many as a mild disease. So we have several questions. I will read it for you and then we can answer. So the first question is from Dr. Munas. Uh, whether Gentleman syndrome can progress to end-stage renal disease. Are you aware of cases um, of end-stage renal disease in Gentleman? I am not aware. Um, of, of course, uh, end-stage renal disease is something that happens in, in, the, um, in, in the normal population, I would say, also. Uh, so, of course, there will be Gentleman patients that, um, that reach end-stage renal disease, but I, I don't think because of Gentleman's uh, syndrome. Um, I think that some of the patients that might have been reported in literature um, uh, um, uh, some time ago might, might also have been one of the other uh, gentleman-like uh, syndromes, uh, for instance, the HNF1 beta patients, uh, of, of which we know that they uh, tend to have um, a reduced uh, kidney function and can progress to end-stage kidney disease. Same also uh, seems to be true for these uh, patients with these mitochondrial mutations. But I think classically in gentleman syndrome, SLC12A3 mutations, that should not um, uh, progress to end-stage kidney uh, uh, failure. Mm -hmm. And that's also what I'm telling my patients that they can be um, uh, that they uh, uh, that in that sense uh, they can be uh, at ease and that they will not uh, because of the Gitterman syndrome uh, uh, be on dialysis or need a kidney transplant. Okay, so thank you. Um, there is another question um, is uh, regarding genotype phenotype. So. Um, is there a genotype phenotype correlation whether patients having homozygous mutations have a more severe phenotype or compared to heterozygous mutation in CLC12 or A3? Um, well, let's say, uh, of course, it's an autosomal recessive disease, right? So, so to have Gitterman syndrome, you need um, uh, two mutations on both alleles. Um, uh, I'm not aware, um, uh, or I just ca can't remember, of studies looking at whether um, uh, you have a worse phenotype when you have, let's say, uh, certain uh, mutations, or uh, whether you are compound, compound hetero, uh, heterozygous in, instead of uh, just homozygous. Um, let's say uh, uh, patients who are heterozygous for SLC12A3, which there are, of course, because these are the family members of, of the Gitterman syndrome patients and, 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 uh, uh, and let's say, the children of the Gitterman syndrome patients. Uh, the, these uh, do not, uh, um, let's say, uh, get Gitterman syndrome, but we do know um, that they tend to have uh, a slightly lower blood pressure. They might also be uh, protected from uh, developing hypertension. So that might be the only upside uh, of that. I okay. don't know whether that answers the question, but uh... yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's 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 a good answer. So another question is, uh, when you look at the adult population, do you see more Gittelman or Barter type three patients? Um, I think um, uh, you you actually see more Gittelman patients, uh, but that is there is a, of course a bias in there. Uh, because I, I still think that the that the uh, uh, type three patients might be diagnosed earlier and maybe in in childhood and in uh, uh, um, in adolescence. Um, um, and at least in in the Dutch situation, sometimes these patients go to um, uh, um, uh, to nephrologists uh, in centers um, uh, near to the place where they live. Um, uh, so I think that is also why there is a bias in the fact that I see more gentleman syndrome patients than I see type 3 Barter syndrome uh, patients. Uh, but, but let's say purely epidemiologically, I would not know. And I also think that there are not very good epidemiological, um, let's say, um, uh, numbers on, on a prevalence of, uh, of Barter uh, type 3 versus gentleman syndrome. Okay, okay. And do you think that um um, some uh, Gittelman syndrome patients can be underdiagnosed, that there are many undiagnosed patients 
in the population mm -hmm. or they would always present with symptoms at certain moment? Yeah, it's, I think they might be un, uh, uh, underdiagnosed. Um, um, and th that can have a diff uh, different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons could be that, that let's say, their um, uh, their hypokalemia is is mild, and maybe their signs are mild, uh, um, and and the hypokalemia is is suggested to to have another cause, let's say. But but like I said, I have also had patients uh, uh, that were actually diagnosed in their 50s or 60s. Um, um, uh, but, but let's say the patient uh, uh, that we just heard in our patient voice, she actually told us that she was uh, um, diagnosed at I think 35 or 39. And of course she had already symptoms before, but for some reason, um, let's say uh, this had never led to the diagnosis of uh, autism syndrome. So, so yes, I think that there will be un undiagnosed uh, patients uh, out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Many patients and many people, thank you for the wonderful lecture, by the way. So I have another question, and the question is whether there are any periods like infection or surgical interventions with a higher risk um, of uh, electrolyte disturbances? Huh? Um, well, that's, that's actually an interesting question. Um, um, uh, well, I think that there there are some, some patients, uh, so, sorry, some publications out there which uh, suggest from an anesthetical view um, that you, of course, have to take care with these patients, right? So um, uh, um, uh, when when they need an uh, an operation, of course, you, you need to uh, normalize intravenously uh, potassium magnesium levels, etc. But I think that that is not actually the question. So the question was, uh, are there any um, uh, uh, any surgical interventions uh, in which these patients are particularly at, at risk? I don't think that that is the case. But what is uh, the case or what, what seems to be becoming clear, and I actually have a slide on that, is that, that maybe there is a broader phenotype in Chittimund syndrome and that actually um, uh, um, um, relates to the question about infections. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this interesting paper a couple of years ago um, that actually suggests that um, if you look very good at these patients, that they have an increased uh, um, tendency to have mucosal infections and allergic disease compared to age match controls. And that there is also a immunological basis for that, or at least there are immunological alterations there where there is an increased ratio of T helper 2 to T helper 17 cells. I'm not an immunologist, so I'm not going to tell you exactly what that means. Uh, but also that extracellular sodium, potassium, magnesium uh, um, uh, uh, um, applied to T cells actually um, uh, reduces this, this ratio. Uh, but unfortunately, as far as I know, there's not yet an, uh, uh, um, a study that actually studied the effect of in vivo correction of sodium losses on, on this, this phenotype. But, but there is a, uh, let's say that there are indications um, uh, that there might also be something with immunology, uh, let, let's say it's this broadly in uh, Ingetomat syndrome. Okay, okay, I think this is a very interesting paper. Uh, I must say I have missed it, so I will read it. Very interesting. Um, so I have another question. We are not done yet. So <laughs> I hope okay. we still have some energy. So um, another question is a practical question about the target values of uh, potassium. Mm -hmm. Uh, so why um, we strive to, to, to reach uh, potassium of 3 and not uh, 3.5? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, um, I, I think that, um, uh, that, that that's a trade-off between, um, let's say, um, uh, you want to be safe uh, and um, uh, you want to be realistic. Um, and uh, the thing is that um, I think when you are at three or above three, then you are safe, and then you have a buffer. Um, a lot of these patients actually are used to having a chronic hypokalemia, and whilst, uh, let's say, um, um, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, palpitations are, are mentioned in all, all these tables, um, I see it rather, um, um, I, I almost never see that in patients. And I think that that is because they are used to it. Um, so of course, if you have these patients on your uh, outpatient clinic and, and, and they have a, a potassium level of 2.8, then your lab calls you and tells you, oh, this is a medical emergency. This patient has a, a, a potassium level of 2.8. And then I, I try to tell them that they shouldn't worry because this patient has had a, 
potassium level of 2.8 for the entire life probably. Um, but but um, uh, so, so I think it's a balance between safety and um, uh, and the the reality that you are not uh, uh, at least a subset of patients you are not going to get above 3.5. Um, and also, we should uh, take into account that you need very high levels of uh, potassium supplementation in a lot of these patients, um, really lethal. So if, if your lab is not calling you because of the potassium of 2.8, then probably your electronic patient uh, system is telling you that you are uh, prescribing uh, lethal doses of potassium to this patient. Um, but, is it, but it is also not very palatable. Uh, so a lot of patients uh, complain of uh, stomach complaints. Uh, you can actually uh, get uh, ulcera uh, um, from uh, uh, from the potassium, especially from the liquid formulation of the potassium. Uh, so so they don't tolerate it. So I think um, let's say this paper actually actually uh, did a good job in saying, well, we don't need to normalize this. This we need to uh, uh, strive for a safe uh, level. Uh, which is, I think, reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. I was very much interested in your trial, just uh, giving sodium chloride in higher doses. So, um, do you think these patients who are eating already a lot of salt, still you yeah. might have some benefit by adding extra salt? Or and, and are you going the trial, normalize their dietary intake? So, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, no, we we are not normalizing the dietary in, intake. Um, uh, so we are we are just doing, let's say, a real life uh, uh, trial, uh, uh, saying uh, if we just take these patients, yeah, that, that's a, that sounds a little bit uh, uh, strange, but if we just ask these patients to take uh, uh, an extra twelve uh, uh, grams of salt, does that do anything on their uh, potassium level? Of course, we are controlling this by uh, by looking at twenty four hour. Uh, uh, urine, uh, sodium excretion, etc., uh, uh, to say uh, to in the end uh, be able to say something about uh, whether they actually increased uh, uh, their potassium intake, uh, sorry, their sodium chloride intake by these uh, sodium chloride uh, tablets, because you can also imagine that um, uh, they could uh, reduce their dietary intake because of that they are already getting this 12 grams uh, of uh, sodium chloride. But we decided not to uh, normalize that because that that would be a big hassle. It would probably uh, uh, reduce the tendency to, uh, of patients to uh, uh, to go for the trial because the trial is actually rather long uh, for 24 uh, weeks. Uh, and and I think that it's nice that that we do a let's say a real life uh, uh, trial. Uh, and the other thing is that it's an N of one trial, so that means that. Um, uh, uh, Primarily, this is a trial setup that will show you whether adding the salt uh, is a good good idea for this individual patient. Um, and of course, in the end, we will put all the, the trials together and see whether there is a general effect in all the patients. But the trial will show you whether uh, adding uh, these tablets has an effect in this individual patient. And if it's if if it's not, then then uh, then we shouldn't add it. Uh, uh, so one of the outcomes of these trials could be that it works, but not in all the patients. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, I think it's very, very meaningful trial. So I think um, we are running out of time. So I, uh, it ends me to, to, to thank you so much. It was, I think it was a very good, very comprehensive and very practical presentation. So thanks a lot. And thank, uh, you, thank you all for, for participating. Thank you.